Yeah. So I'm Jacqueline Gill. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maine. I'm a paleoecologist, so I play well with zooarchaeologists. I, at least I hope I do. Um, and I think that we are in a particularly important place to be able to not only think about the rise of climate doomism um, amongst ourselves as people who are deeply engaged in climate work um, because, our, because our work intersects so much with global change problems, but also to provide some information and uh, and just a little bit of, of, of hopeful frameworks for people because we study periods of time where biodiversity and humanity have come through some pretty big environmental challenges. Um, and I think that people can look to us, can look to the past um, for some guidance in terms of you know, road mapping our future. I think a lot of the um, anxiety that we feel comes from a sense of uncertainty about what might come. And for me, at least the paleo record, um, the fossil record, especially the recent one is a really great way forward there. So I wanna share a little bit about the rise of doomism um, and, and just very quickly how we can be and we should be thoughtful um, because this is a new challenge for those of us who engage in climate communication. All right, so um, I have only been doing this work um, and by this work, I mean climate communication uh, since around in, in, in a really active way since around 2010, which is when I joined uh, Twitter and then 2011, I started blogging. Um, and at that time, I was really concerned about denial, right? Um, we were trained to convince people that climate change was real, that it's a problem, that it's us, and that there are solutions. And then for about the next decade, it, it felt like that was, those were the tools that we needed and that was the fight that we were fighting. Um, but it turns out the game has changed and it's changed quite quickly. And I think we as communicators and the scientific community are still grappling to, to catch up. Um, and here's some data, it's actually a little bit out of date. Um, th this data is only available for the US and the US I should emphasize has a uniquely dysfunctional climate uh, conversation. But this is also true for um, other petrochemical uh, heavy uh, uh, regions, um, places where fossil fuels are uh, manufactured and used. Um, so Australia, um, parts of Great Britain. So this is not just, I think, uh, applicable to the US. I think there are other parts of the world where you know we can take some of these lessons. Um, so this is highly granular data, like at the county level um, for that has been going on for about a decade now that's been coming out of Yale, where they do repeat surveys multiple times a year, and they've been tracking Americans' belief on climate change. And what we're finding is that there's not a there are not two Americas, there are six Americas in terms of uh, defining climate belief. And if you look, the dismissives, which is their category for denier, if you wanna kind of lump these two, they're actually the smallest groups. They're very vocal. I think we've all run into them, but they're extremely rare. And they've they dropped into the single digits around the, by the end of 2020. And I think this number might be down to 7% now um, if I updated this figure. Meanwhile, the cautious concern and alarmed end of the spectrum has been growing, right? And on the one hand, that's a good thing. It means people are engaged there. We, we no longer have to convince them this is a problem, but there is a flip side to this. And that's a that's the problem that we're not prepared to, to address, um, which is that there's growing anxiety as people are becoming more aware of climate change, um, partly because of their own lived experiences, because the media discussions have shifted, there's a whole bunch of reasons, we're seeing a rise in climate anxiety. So climate awareness and anxiety seem to be coming hand in hand for all kinds of really valid reasons. And I won't talk about this very much, but it's important to remember that these emotional responses that people have to the climate crisis are valid. The feelings are real. Um, we shouldn't downplay them or dismiss them. There are people who work on these topics in psychology, social sciences, um, communication science. That's important, but we can learn from, from their work and, and think about how we respond when we hear those kinds of messages come up in our own engagement with the public, or maybe even among our friends, our family, our colleagues, or in ourselves. Um, so what changed? What happened? How did we go from it's not happening to, oh, God, it's too late. We're all going to die. <laughs> There's a few things, you know, rise of discussion of climate in popular media. Um, Yale also did a, a project on this where they found that the day after tomorrow was actually more impactful in terms of raising climate awareness than an inconvenient truth. 
So this is a fiction, this is a documentary. Um, and yet the fictional version did more to raise public awareness of climate change than the nonfiction version. And I think that's a powerful message that we should take forward when we think about shaping our own climate communication. The power of narrative, the power of stories, these things are, are really, you know, they're, they're really impactful. Um, but this was back in 2004, 2006. I was, you know, just starting grad school at that time. Um, you know, obviously it took a long time for sort of the general public and this rise of awareness. Um, and the, the fact is climate change happened, right? We have the, the 10 hottest years on record globally. Look at, look at how many of those have happened just in the last decade, right? At some point, reality catches up to our, our understanding of what's going to happen in the future, right? The projections start coming true. And so I think that's a big, uh, a big part of it. And then 2018 becomes kind of a watershed moment. And I'm sorry to throw Jem Bendel under the bus here, but I think that the publication of the deep adaptation document, um, which was a white paper um, that came out in 2018, uh, had did a lot to shape the narrative of everything that came after. And in this white paper, um, they say, mitigation is basically not enough to stave off collapse, like full societal collapse is imminent. Um, and that word has very specific meaning to, you know, anthropologists, archaeologists, right? Even with total decarbonization and aggressive solar geoengineering. So even with what is technically science fiction levels of intervention, society is still going to collapse um, and that we have to tell the truth and be honest about that. Now, this document was heavily criticized um, for lots of reasons. Um, there were a lot of scientific critiques about the certainty of collapse, um, but there were also some problems from a social justice framework. For example, it completely fails to account for the fact that climate disasters have already been occurring outside the West and the global North, right? For many parts of the world, the you know climate emergency has been here for a long time and we don't see those communities giving up right um the framework lacks climate justice i.e this idea that uh, the people who are suffering the most and the first impacts of climate change were the ones that have contributed the least right communities of color black indigenous etc um, it's also overly fatalistic removing any hope any possibility of alternative outcomes which is a problem from a, a a comms perspective, it's also unscientific, right? We know that that's not the case. Um, and so there was some concerns that started bubbling up even back in 2018, that this pseudoscientific or doomist framing uh, could lead us down the same path as climate denialism. And so then around the same time, so 2018 is really a watershed moment, we start to see you know, Greta Thunberg, the Fridays for Future protests start happening. We see the rise of Extinction Rebellion. People start taking to the streets. All of this is happening at once. Um, so, you know, here's Greta. Um, we also see this article uh, in The Guardian, which I love The Guardian, but this article has 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 uh, created a, pro a problematic framing, right? So this is this comes out of that um, IPCC report, basically saying we have seven years to uh, forestall the uh, or to to reach our 1.5 target, which was always a highly ambitious target. Um, and basically, this framework, or sorry, it was 12 years at this time. Um, this framework really creates this public perception of a point of no return. And when you mix that in with this idea of an imminent collapse, the take home message for large portions of the public is that our window to do anything about climate change is shrinking. After that point, it's game over, right? And so it introduces this binary framework of we are either going to make it through or we're all going to die. And that is a message that you hear from people over and over again. And it's highly problematic, right? Because it's not an accurate representation of the science. Um, which isn't to say that 1.5 isn't bad, two degrees isn't catastrophic, right? But two degrees is better than 2.5, 2.5 is better than three, three is better than four, right? We know that this is not a pass fail scenario, that the more, uh, every, every fraction of a degree is worth fighting for, right? And there's not a moment, uh, there's not a point of no return or a cliff that we're gonna fall off. And so people have taken this messaging and if, if turned it in this case into a literal clock that is counting down to the essentially the end of the world, right? And so you can see where people have just enough information to feel despair, but not enough to feel that they can be motivated. And so what else are you gonna feel about? We're doomed, right? And I wanna be very clear here that doomism, I, 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 you know, is both a feeling that people internalize that they have no sense of hope, 
Um, but also when you are evangelical about that and you try to convince other people that nothing can be done and it's time to run off and start our compounds, et cetera, that's defeatism, right? That is aggressively pushing the idea that we can't do anything and therefore we should give up, right? And who does that serve? Who does that help, right? Who is that going to hurt the first and the most? All these marginalized communities, people with disabilities, right? And those people are not expendable in the climate crisis. So there's all kinds of ways in which these feelings can be harmful, both in terms of disengagement, um, but also in terms of, you know, for personal disengagement, but also for sort of spreading this idea that nothing can be done. And again, that leads to some people to, to worry that doomism is, is the new denial if the, imp if the outcomes are the same. This is a really great paper on the discourses of climate delay. I highly recommend it. Um, but essentially, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which we talk about the climate crisis, maybe not even consciously. Um, and the wording that we're using or the frameworks that we're using, they all lead to the same place, which is delaying action, right? So this individualistic idea of, oh, it's your personal carbon footprint, you know, obviously nothing any one of us do as individualists, unless we have a billionaire in the room, which I don't think we do, um, is going to make a difference, right? But, you know, even collectively, it's not going to make enough of a dent in the problem. Technological optimism, right? Oh, it'll, well, you know, we can just keep doing what we're doing and solar geoengineering will save, will save us. Um, or it'll be too disruptive to the economy, right? All of these um, frameworks, and here they have doomism explicitly, um, lead to climate delay. And that's a concern. Um, so what we need to be doing, and this is getting harder and harder all the time, is to stop thinking in binaries. Climate change is not a pass-fail problem. If we blow past 1.5 or even 2 degrees, which we've already warmed about 1.1 degrees Celsius, so that's looking, at least 1.5 is looking probably likely, um, that doesn't mean it's game over. It doesn't mean we give up, right? Um, and, and yet I hear from especially young people all the time asking me, should I even go to college? Will I have a world to grow up in? Is it ethical to have children if we're, they're just going to be born into an apocalypse? Will I even grow up at all, right? And to have an, an, an email inbox that gets at least five or six of these a week, more on, you know, bad weeks, um, that is a lot, right? Um, it's a lot to grapple with. It's not something that I was trained how to deal with, right? It's not something that most of us are trained in how to deal with. And so I think, you know, most of us who have engaged in these spaces as public communicators have noticed a big uptick in this kind of framing and these kinds of feelings, um, at least since 2018 and definitely, you know, growing exponentially every year. And I love to point people toward Mary Heglar's writing in particular. She's been really impactful on how I think and talk about climate change. And you know, here she, she mentions, you know, you don't need a guarantee of success before you risk everything to save the things, the people, and the places you love, right? We'll never see a perfect world. A world warmed by two degrees is preferable to one warmed by three degrees or six degrees, right? And this is the kind of messaging that we need but it's just not as catchy. It's it's not as, it, it doesn't make as good of a headline, right? It doesn't sort of catch the imagination as much. Um, and on some levels, there's some psychology that says, you know, just accepting the worst possible outcome is, is, a, is a defense mechanism. It's something that people do to protect themselves. I'm just gonna give up, I'm gonna give in because the uncertainty is scarier, right? We see this in all kinds of, um, you know, everything from the rise of people who study the rise of fascism to all kinds of other um, moments of, of existential angst and, and uncertainty about the future that causes people to turn inwards, to behave more individualistically. Um, all the things that we don't need people to be doing uh, in the climate crisis. So we also know from psychology research that fear appeals don't work. We need solutions to be attached to those messaging, right? So some people have really leaned into the fear part of, of uh, science communication that we need to shock people awake. We need to really get them to buy into this problem. And I think that that's an outdated mode, right? We're, we're past the point where we have to convince the majority of the public in most places that climate change is real. We have data on this, right? We know that that's the case. Um, and also, if you just process your anxiety publicly, your uncertainty, and you don't give people a direction in terms of where to go, then all you're doing is um, 
is giving them the sense, especially those of us who are seen as authorities, that nothing can be done. Because if we can't do anything, if we don't know what to do, what are they supposed to do, right? So we have to take our platforms as public communicators very seriously and the responsibility that we have, which isn't to say that you can't have an emotional response to climate change and you can't be public about that. We know from climate or from communication research broadly that being your whole self, being a whole person in these public spaces builds trust, it builds community, right? Um, so you can talk about your own struggles, your anxieties, your fears, but be trauma informed, right? Understand the impacts of your framing, be savvy, be thoughtful and think about your end goals. Is the end goal just to use you know, the public as a form of therapy to, you know, exercise your emotions, that might not be as impactful as thinking about, you know, okay, well, what I would like to do is motivate people to some kind of action, right? That's, that's, those are two different, very different ways of approaching the, uh, your, your climate communications when we're in this crisis moment. And so as a framework, an alternative framework um, to doomism, I've talked about this idea of being a climate muskox. Um, and that's just because I think muskox are amazing. Um, for three reasons. First, they're incredibly resilient. They're ice age survivors. Um, they're one of the last you know, surviving species of megafauna that we have um, in large parts of the world. And so what that means is we can take a lesson from muskox that we should be solutions fo focused. Um, we should be focusing on mitigation and adaptation. Um, we should share positive stories when we can so that people know that their actions matter, that they can be inspired right, to, to build you know, in their communities, even in the absence of strong top-down leadership, which many of us in many of the places we live are lacking, right? We don't have good action from our leaders, but we can scale down to our schools, to our communities, our towns, our states, our provinces, whatever, right? So there are other pathways there at many scales. Um, and also focusing on your mental health, focusing on your own sustainability. We all have a personal responsibility to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. Most of us came to the work that we do because we wanna make a difference, right? Um, yeah, the earth is wonderful, it's a fantastic puzzle, um, but I think most of us also deeply care about it, right? Not just because it's our home. Um, and so we have a responsibility to be taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of each other because it's the only way that we're gonna get through this. Uh, secondly, um, they're matriarchal. So we need to be looking to feminist models of leadership. We need to be focusing on climate justice, right? So the next time you think I'm just gonna run off to my compound, you know, screw you all, like this is zombie apocalypse. Think about who is out there who maybe doesn't have the same resources that you have. Um, think about the communities that have already been grappling with climate change. How have they been dealing with it, right? They don't have the luxury of just picking up and running off to a cabin in the woods. Um, so we need to be thinking about justice throughout the entire climate process of from, from you know, emissions all the way down to the impacts of our solutions. And if we don't do that, then we're leaving people out and that's not fair or just. Um, we also should be thinking about structural problems rather than this focus on individualistic solutions. And thirdly, muskox are a powerful collective, right? Um, you know, when, they're, when the herd is threatened, they gather up in these formations with their faces outwards and their backs uh, together. Um, and all the vul vulnerable are inside of that group, right? The elderly, the very young, um, they work together to protect the herd. And so we have to fight as a community or as a group of communities, this push towards individualism. How do you, you know, how are you feeling? What do you need? Um, what are you gonna do to protect yourself, right? We need to be thinking about organization. We need to be thinking about collective actions, whether those are things like protests um, or other or voting or letter writing campaigns. Um, we need to be building coalitions with the groups that have been out there doing this work for decades. We can learn from them, right? We can work together. And we need, we need to be thinking about mutual aid. We need to be checking in on our neighbors and building more resilient social networks. Um, offline and online um, so that we can come to do this work sustainably and compassionately together, right? And the biggest piece of advice that I give to people when they come to me saying, I don't know what to do, I tell them to get involved, right? 95% of the time, the people who feel the most despair 
are just doom scrolling on their own. They're reading content. Um, they're just spiraling by themselves. But as soon as they get involved with a group, an organization, they start organizing protests. They start thinking about, you know, ways that they can get involved in their local governments. They start to feel better. The best solution that I have found to that feeling of despair is just to get active and to get active with others who care about the same things that you care about. And that is, you know, an incredible panacea. And there are so many ways that people can get involved on so many levels from so many skill sets that it's usually really easy to, to find a way to plug in, right? And so we can help people do that um, by connecting them with, you know, organizations, events, um, you know, groups, whatever it is that, you know, to help them feel less alone. So with that, I just want to leave you with a few ways forward. Tell your climate story, not just in terms of your own work, your research, but also your personal experiences. Build trust in your communities as scientists, um, because it's really important right now that there people are looking to us for leadership. Um, and so anything we can do to be accessible, to tell our own personal stories of climate change, to normalize discussions of climate change in our everyday lives, that's actually really impactful and powerful. Catherine Hayhoe has done a tremendous job of really stressing the need to be talking about it and not just being kind of internal with our, our own processing. And we should be drawing roadmaps toward new futures. A lot of the problems we're running into in the climate community and the climate conversation is a failure of imagination. The latest IPCC report was very clear. The solutions are already here. We have everything we need to address this problem with the tools that we have. We just haven't done it, right? And so I think people really need a roadmap towards futures in their mind, whether that's through fiction, through science, um, you know, anything that we can do to show them there are multiple pathways here. And that uncertainty does not have to be scary. It can be our biggest asset because it means we have the ability to make choices about what our future looks like. That is so powerful, right? We can do this with intention. Uh, Oops, sorry, emphasize collective actions rather than individual ones. It is too easy to feel overwhelmed by the scale of climate change because as one person, I can only sacrifice so much or give up so much or make so many lifestyle choices and I still feel like I'm not making a difference, right? That is by design, right? The fossil fuel companies want you to feel hopeless. So we have to fight that sense of individualism, especially because as fear rises, people turn towards individualism even more. So it becomes this reinforcing cycle and that can be really damaging and hard to shake people out of. Um, anytime you can, and this is where our scientific training becomes really helpful, we have to reject binary thinking. Climate change is not pass fail, right? There's a continuum of harm. Harm has already happened. So a no harm scenario was never possible because plenty of people have already been harmed by climate change, right? And so we can be good ancestors by doing everything we can now to prevent more harm later. And zooarchaeology can really help here. Um, we can fight against collapse narratives. We can talk about the communities who have been resilient in the past to the kinds of global changes that we're expecting. We can talk about, you know, not just in terms of warning, but also in terms of lessons and, and strategies and ways forward. And that ties back into that concept of roadmaps. We are all global change experts, right? That is what we do. Um, and so, you know, regardless of, you know, our own individual angles on that, whether we're studying the impacts on biodiversity or on social systems, communities, whatever, um, we can use our knowledge of the past to tell good stories about the future and to help people feel a little bit less alone. And you can also just hook them with the cool science factor because who doesn't love a woolly mammoth, right? Who doesn't love learning about archeology? span um, And that's a moment where you can bring people in and then make them realize that the earth has left us a roadmap for how to get out of the climate crisis, right? We are not just walking into the future blindfolded. So with that, I hope we have some time. I think we have some time for questions.